Uh, yeah, I, I was uh, I was raised in a family. So I was raised in Switzerland, in, in Geneva, and um, I think my parents, uh, you know, always trusted me in terms of what I was watching. They never really questioned. That I was very free to, to watch what what I wanted to watch, and um, and from a very early age, I was watching a lot of Hitchcock, uh, and I was watching a lot of horror films. And, uh, you know, as far as the impact that it has on me as a person, I mean, hopefully I'm okay. I don't know. You, you guys tell me, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell more in a second. Do you? Yeah. 我从小就在这个，我从小小时候生长的地方是瑞士的日内瓦。我的父母其实对我非常的放心，非常的信任，所以他们会不会去质疑，或者是会去怀疑我要想看什么片，让我想看什么电影都可以。所以我小时候就看
you know, uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Um, but in, in preparation for the film, I um, I actually went on a vineyard in, in Northern California in a beautiful place um, to counterbalance the, the horror of The Exorcist. And um, and that's where I prepared uh, for uh, about a month. And um, I took The Exorcist with me and I watched the film every day for 30 days straight, um, which I do not recommend you guys do. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <笑>所以刚才提到的是在前面这个跟异形有关的电影当中 风光明媚的地方，为了要去平衡这个大法师的恐惧感，所以我还在这个风光明媚地方准备一个月的时间，在那个月当中，三十天里面，每一天都看一次大法师。那这种情况，这种这种练习跟这种体验，就不建议各位
And, and I felt when he delivered that monologue, there was no question in my mind that this was going to be the, the end of the film, that everything had to move towards that moment because I feel that that's the, uh, you know, if, if, if you boil it down to one thing, this is what William Friedkin is all about. And I think that, um, you know, uh, I think this is the result of having a, had a personal relationship with him. And I think the result of spending six days of interviews as opposed to, you know, two hours, you, you get you get to those moments. And, and um, you, you know, I don't think we've ever seen William Friedkin quite that candid, you know. 在这部作品当中，我们用透过这种非常贴身、非常近身的采访和这个对话过程当中，去了解这个人、这位导演他的创作历程。那最后的时候，我们当然讨论到，在这部纪录片里一直讨论到这个 Grace Note， 或者是所谓的巧思，或者是灵光等等的。对他而言，对这位导演而言，他的巧思跟灵光来自于日本京都的禅风的花园。那我们当时在最后就认为，这个独白在最后变得非常的世界跟非常的重要，因为最后而言，终归一句还是要回到这位导演本身自己的灵光跟。自己的想法，所以当时这是我们在经过了六天采访之后，六六天对话之后所决定做的结尾。毕竟这是个连续六天的采访，而并不只是一个两个小时的对话而已。Well, I didn't convince anybody.、Uh, <laughs> I uh, so no, so we have the, we have this thing in the, in the U.S. called、uh, called fair use, and so I, I don't know how much how deep I should go into this, but it is basically the equivalent of what we call rights of quotation. In a, a book, if you're quoting another work, and then at the end of the book you will credit the the, the, the original writer of that.、Um, fair use works for documentary filmmakers the way that rights of quotation work for authors. And so,、um, in this particular case, we had to dig up and find those versions that that existed. So we didn't we didn't go to the composers. I mean, we、uh, there's there's no、um, there's no licensing fees. Spent. We had to find the stuff and then use it in the film, but it has to be cleared for fair use. So、um, it's it's a fairly complicated legal process, which I'm sure you guys are not here to, you know, <laughs> to hear about. But it's、uh, in in a nutshell, that's that's how it works. 在写学术论文的时候，或者是在做纪录片的时候，其实都有一个所谓合理使用这样的概念。就比如说你在学术论文里面，你要引用某人的时候，你有这个引用权，但前提是你在最后的时候要注明它的出处跟来源。这个情况在纪录片也是一样的，所以前提是我们必须要去找到这段音乐之后，找到它的出处，在最后能够注明。所以这种情况之下，你不用直接跟作曲人或当初的原原文的作者去沟通或者是说服他，你只要在部分最后的时候能够清楚的注明出处来源，你就可以在影片。里面或者是你的论文里面引用它，这在台湾是蛮难想象的哦。那呃，可能不知道是不是，可能导演也许可以待会再稍微再多说一点点。比如说，在美国是有这样的机制，是所有的，比如说呃，这些大八大的影片也都是可以这样子使用吗？然后声音、画面、音乐、剧照，以及比如说出现在疫情里面的这些画作。呃，都是可以透过这样的机制去申请吗？就是他们其实需要一个怎么样的一个，比如说 proposal 的呈现等等的。Yeah, so so basically every clip that you see in the film is fair use,、uh, and that includes every clip from The Exorcist.、Um, uh, the the stills, however,、uh, the great majority of them, in fact, I think all of them. Um, be, uh, you know, came from William Friedkin's collection, which you know he gave me full rights to to use. And what's what's interesting is that,、um, you know, whatever's in his collection, even if it's part of The Exorcist, if it belongs to him, we, you know, legally we don't have to go to Warner Brothers to to、uh, to ask for that. So,、um, yeah, it's a it's a strange kind of you know process. But、uh, yeah, every clip is is fair use, absolutely. 所以当然，今天各位不是不是来讲法务课的啦。不过基本上的话，各位今天看到的所有的片段，都是来自于所谓这个合理使用的权利。那包括各位看到很多的艺术品呢，其实还有这些的作画作等等，都是来自 William f r i c k i n 这位导演他自己个人的收藏。所以依据这个合理使用的原则的话，基本上比如说我们不用去通知华纳兄弟公司，所以这个都在合理使用的范围之内。
好，我其实不会觉得这是一个很奇怪的，我觉得这是一个蛮令人向往的一个一种机制哦，就是在台湾完全无法想象。你看我们所拍摄的所有的，要授权一个某一个画面，可能都要跑去英国，然后呢，对方也不授权等等的状况，其实都曾经有过。那所以觉得，反正是这样子的，这我就想到一个问题说，所以其实我们拍摄在美国拍摄纪录片都可以合法的授合法的使用。但是会不会其实是有事后在这个纪录片完成之后，反而出现的有人来抗议呢，或是有有不同的意见，有有遇过这样子的状况过吗 ？So, um, it, when you when you do fair use, you can't just use footage, um, because you want to. You, you every single clip has to be done in a very specific way. You you know you you. It has to be the right use, and it has to be the right length. Um, you can't just use, you know, what we call B-roll. You know, you 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 can't extend a clip beyond what you need um, because that's no longer fair use. Then you would be essentially taking advantage of the film itself. But um, you know, there are a few law firms uh, in the U.S. that specialize in fair use. Uh, there is one in particular. Um, called Donaldson and Caliph that we work with. They are the best. Uh, they've never had any uh, lawsuits. They've never because everybody knows that they do it exactly right. Um, and so uh, it's a pretty smooth process, to be honest. Um, there's there's really no issues. 在美国，这个制度叫做合理使用的制度。当然，前提它是它是合理的，你不能够想用就用。换言之，你在使用的时候，你要有合理的用途、合理的长度。你如果用了超过你应该或者需要的长度的时候，那就等于是在剥削或者利用原版的作品了。所以这种情况之下，当然会衍生很多的法律问题。不过，在美国有几家专门在处理这些所谓合理使用范围的法律事务所。那我们跟其中最顶尖的合法律事务所合作之后呢，其实没有遇到任何的问题。其实过程非常平顺，因为他们的确都非。非常清楚知道所谓合理使用的范围、条件跟限制。Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I I think um, let let me try to phrase that. I th I think that the 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 beauty about uh, The Exorcist, very specifically, as a movie, as a story, uh, is that it is a it is a story about mystery. And as he says, it's not a it's not a story about faith or fate. It's a story about the mysteries of faith, of faith and fate, and it's really both. Um, the the fact that the Catholic Church um, to this day still has exorcists, um, that the Vatican has exorcists, that there are uh, you know. Tens of thousands of people who are trying to get um, exorcisms. Only a few of them actually get assigned an exorcist. Um, is quite mysterious. The fact that there are certain behaviors that you know uh, psychologists, doctors can't can't explain. Um, you you can make of that what you will. I um, I don't know. I mean, there's obviously. So much that we don't know. There's there's a lot more in life that we don't know than stuff that we know. But and and I think that that's something that William Friedkin and I actually we we're, we're very much on the same. Uh, we see eye to eye on that. I think that's the that is that is the beauty of life. That that, that we there's so much that we don't know. Uh, and I think if we stay open to that and curious about it, um, then we, you know, life is never boring. It's always incredible. You know. 我觉得《大法师》这部片之所以迷人，或之所以值得看再看，是因为它探讨的是。关于生命、还有命运、还有信仰之间的神秘，它并不是完全直接去触及这个所谓的命运或信仰，而是它它探讨它的神秘性。那时至今日，其实天主教会依然会有这个驱魔的仪式。那也许在世界上有很多人都曾经有这种想象，想象说是不是有机会接受这个驱魔仪式？但其实这个驱魔仪式，其实只有极少数的人曾经经历过，或曾经看过，或曾经感受过。所以这还是一个非常神秘的事情，我们还是有很多未知的事情。我觉得人的生命当。中最难能可贵的地方，是我们对于未我们的未知远大于已知的情况之下，才会有这么多神秘的事情发生，还有这么多不知道的事情发生。而我这也是我跟 William Brooks 这位导演彼此之间的共识是
，就是因为这些神秘性、这些不可知性，而让生命变得如此的美好或这么的迷人。所以，因为这些的未知之后，才让生命不会觉得任何任何社会感到无聊。Uh, well, uh, you mean the the the, the Fritz Lang segment? Um, yeah, I mean it. It it felt you know it felt natural to me. Obviously, what's what's so interesting is is that he had, um, you know, he had made a film about Fritz Lang. Uh, it's a conversation with Fritz Lang, just the way that I had a conversation with him, which is like for me, like it's really weird, you know, as a um, as a, a person who, uh, you know, I'm such a Fan of of films and filmmakers, you know, I, I revere Fritz Lang, I revere William Friedkin, and the the I just thinking about the idea that he asked me to, you know, he put me in a position where I could make this film, and and to think about me sitting in front of him, but that years ago he was sitting in front of Fritz Lang is is kind of uh, it gives me the chills, you know, it's really mind blowing stuff, um, but it's. Um, uh, you know, I, I think those are techniques that he took directly from Fritz Lang, because obviously you, you can hear Fritz Lang say that to him when he was a young filmmaker, you know? Um, and I think that's pretty remarkable, um, that sort of direct line of connection and how much one master filmmaker can learn directly from another. Um, and although you can argue on the one hand, you can say William Friedkin learned that from Fritz Lang. On the other hand, you can say William Friedkin was already like that. And he connected with Fritz Lang because Fritz Lang was also like that, which I think is probably truer. 其实我在我儿子对我而言，我一直都非常敬仰温布莱这位大导演。但是光是想到有机会坐在他面前，然后访问他，我就觉得觉得非常的感动，甚至已经开始在起鸡皮疙瘩了。而想象想到温布莱根以前曾经去访问过 First Lens， 今天角色互换，我有机会去访问温布莱根，所以这就是一个另外一个我觉得非常感动的地方。而当然有些人会说，啊、呃，其实这好像是一个一代代的传承一样，过去 First Lens 把这样的技术传承给了温布莱根，然后他今天在镜头前面侃侃而谈，跟我们分享这些东西。有些人会觉得这是一个学习的过程，也有些人是说，过去其实 William Friedkin 就已经跟 Fritz Lang 一样，他们两个只是精神呃精神所见略同，所以这是两种不一样去切入这个关系的看法。嗯、um, that, ，That was actually um well two things about this. One, first, um we did not want to talk about special effects. Um I I he basically said who cares and. <laughs> And I agree. I I think it's um, I think he actually told me he said that if he were to make The Exorcist today, he would pull way back on the special effects. Um, and so again, to me, this was a different kind of film. I think this is you know, Leap of Faith is is uh, you know had to be a film about looking at The Exorcist through the lens of you know a fine art of of classical music of classic cinema. Uh, which is a different way to look at it, you know. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you about the spider walk in a second. Just go ahead. That's <laughs> <laughs> what it's called. Yeah. Yeah, this is called the spider walk. Yeah, it's a special name. This So the, the spider walk is actually, um, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, as I'm sure you know, in the 1973 version, it, it, he brought it back in the 2000 version of the film. Um, I'm not, I'll be very vocal about this, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, of the scene. And I'm not a fan of the scene because I think the beauty of The Exorcist as a, um, a as a journey, as a story, is that you know if you want to look at it in terms of the Joseph Campbell uh, model, the 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 abyss is the room, and and the demon is inside the abyss, is inside the room, and the hero, in this case, the heroes are trying to go inside the abyss to conquer the demon, but they keep being rejected and they keep having to try to go back in until they succeed. To have 
to take the demon out of the abyss, to me, um, makes it less powerful as a film. Uh, and I think it takes some power out of the abyss. So, um, but again, the, the reason why it's not in there is one, because of special effects, and two, because the 2000 version is actually not a director's cut. It is called the version you've never seen. And he remade that film very specifically because there were things that William Blatty wanted to bring back in the film. Um, I think William Friedkin was probably, would have been fine with the 73 version <coughs> as, as it is. 在这个房间里面的所以我自己会认为对于Wilfrigans而言 Yeah, of course, I always have um, uh, not, not just new ideas, but always there's always a film I have to be working on otherwise I feel like, like a bum if I'm not working on a movie um, So right now I'm actually uh, going away from horror for a little bit which feels pretty good uh, It's um, it's a film about John Ford and Monument Valley. Uh, so it's a really a look at the Western, but it's kind of a deconstruction of the myth of the West and looking very specifically at the way that John Ford films and frames the monuments in Monument Valley over the course of his nine Westerns. And in doing so, um, how he essentially built um, part of our psychic West, which of course is, you know, as we say in the US, fake news. <laughs> 我一直说我如果不是在拍纪录片就是正在准备拍纪录片所以我一直都有新的作品新的想法正在进行那目前的话暂时就先把恐怖片放在旁边其实感觉还不错就好像现在我们说的假新闻一样它是一切都是虚构出来的共构出来的故事 Well, you know, I, I, there's a thing I, I always like to say is that I don't choose my films, my films choose me and, and, um, and, and I think that's been really largely true for my entire career um, something happens um, whether consciously or unconsciously and, and I feel you know, it's like this deep sort of need to tell that particular story in, in a particular way um, it comes very quickly. Um, I, uh, you know, memory or 1752, I don't remember the exact moment when I had the thought, um, but, it, but it happened. And, and at that point, um, I worked very quickly in terms of, you know, the style comes to me very quickly, and then I, I start, you know, uh, broadly structuring the film, and, and once I understand the story, the very specific angle that I want to tell, then, you know, then it becomes about figuring out how to tell that story and how to film it. Uh, so, you know, but Leap of Faith was different because I was not at all planning on making a film about The Exorcist, but I met uh, Bill Friedkin in, um, in Spain, in Sitges, and he invited me to his table. And, and then he, he took my phone and he, he had, you know, he loved 7852, and he uh, took my phone and wrote his email address and said, I want to buy you lunch next time you're in L.A. And three weeks later, I was in L.A. In, in LA and, and he baited me to make this film. So it was his idea. It was not my idea. <laughs> 
我常常都说是电影选择了我，不是我选择电影。所以很对我而言，很多时候我当然一直以来都希望能够有特定的方式来说特定的故事。然后呢，我常,常很多时候我并不记得，比如说《七八五二》这个喜剧考科的电影，还有或者是跟这个异形有关的电影，它的当时一开始的灵感是什么时候发生的？但我有了这个灵感跟想法之后呢，我的确开始就很快决定了要怎么样去进行，然后什么样的角度，什么样的风格，然后接下来接下来要思考的只是如何用什么样的。方式来陈述这样的故事，那相较而言，《大法师》的这部纪录片的情况完全不一样。其实我是在西班牙的时候第一次遇到 William Frankens 这位大导演，他当时就跟我相谈甚欢，之后就把他的联络方式给我，之后说：“我希望下次你来 L A， 就是来洛杉矶的时候，可以我们可以共进午餐。”然后三个礼拜之后，我就到了他们他家去吃午餐，然后基本上是他。引诱我进入这部作品，所以并不是我主动想要提出做这部作品。Yeah, I mean, the, the answer is very simple: is that is that、um, I, you know, I, I felt that that was a story that had been told to death.、Uh, you know, it's pretty much in every single、uh, you know interview、uh, with William Friedkin. It's you see it in a lot of behind-the-scenes documentaries, and I felt like it.、Um, it didn't again tie as powerfully to those ideas of. Faith or fate, as I think it, some of these other stories did for me, and and I felt like you know we we had those decisions to make because it's already an hour and forty five minute film, which is long for a one man show. I, as William Frick actually told me when I told him the length, he said,、uh, he said that's that's a, that's, a, that's really long for for an old Jew.、Uh, he's a really he's a funny guy,、um, but.、Uh, But so, so we know we we really wanted the film to be about an hour and a half, and and I felt like we we really couldn't. I mean, the the first cut was three hours and ten minutes.、Uh, we we there was a point where I felt like this was the right length,、uh, but there were a few things like Linda Blair,、uh, where I felt like it wasn't it wasn't、uh, stuff that I wanted to revisit、uh, because there, he didn't provide anything. New or profound about it, and so that's why it's out. 其实答案很简单，就是我觉得相较于其他的故事的话，我们今天探讨这部作品，其实刚才提到跟命运还有呃信仰的神秘性有关系。我觉得相较于其他故事，跟这个小女孩之间的选角故事并没有这么扣合的信仰主题，所以我们当时当然在选角，在这个故事的选材方面必须要做取舍，因为毕竟各位看到的是一个一小时四十五分钟的版本。当时我们就是觉得这是一个独角戏，独角戏演一小时四十五分钟其实还蛮长的。我当时把这个长度告诉 Willie Frickens， 他就说我们。要听一个犹太老人家聊这么长的久的话，好像有点久。所以其实一开始我们本来出剪版其实是三小时十分钟，但是后来呢，其实我们经过一些调整之后，我们决定不要把这段放进去。而且对我来说，其实关于这个小女孩的故事，不管不管在 Willie Frigus 的其他的访谈当中，很多的幕后影片当中，其实都探究过了，所以我们就决定不要老掉重谈。But but also you know keep in mind that、uh, as I said you know we've、uh, we spent six days interviewing uh, uh, Billy. And、uh, so there's a lot of really great stuff that we have that unfortunately didn't make it into the film. So hopefully, I'm hoping the film will be eventually released、uh, on on Blu-ray, hopefully multiple、uh, editions. And I'm really hoping that、uh, one edition I would like to put everything. I would like to put the whole six days of interviews as a bonus as a bonus feature. I think it'd be amazing. Okay, 当然呢，现在的话 maybe there's a distributor in Taiwan here who wants to do it. 各位有看到的一小时四十五分钟的版本，我当然希望有机会的话，我们在这个六天的访谈过程当中，其实有很多很多精彩的片段。但因为长度的关系，必须割舍，所以我当然希望，也许未来出的蓝光版或者其他版本的时候，我有机会也许可以把六天访问的内容全部一股脑的放进去。Um, so you know the, the writing process is a bit different, obviously, for、um, nonfiction versus fiction.、Um, I, I, I clearly, I. It, it's very important to have a very clear sense of the story you want to tell before you even start the interview process, because otherwise you're going to go all over the place.、Um, so I had a sense of the structure.、Um, what I did not know starting it was、uh, obviously some of the most profound things he was going to talk about. I did not know he was going to talk about. I did not know that.、Uh, That the ideas of faith and fate were so central to his philosophy, as as a human being and as a filmmaker, 
I did not know he was going to bring up grace notes. I certainly did not know that he was going to talk about the Kyoto Zen Gardens on day four in the way that he did uh, with tears in his eyes. And uh, that's the kind of stuff that I, this is what I love so much what I do because if you pay attention, um, those things will basically happen and you go, okay, this is what the movie is about. And I have to recalibrate and change my structure to fit that now. Because when he delivered that monologue, that very moment I knew that's the end of the film. What it meant also is I had to go to Kyoto. And <laughs> I, there was no way around it, you know. And I, there's no way that this film would be as, I think, I think you know, the, the final scene would be as powerful if we had not gone to Kyoto. And of course, we wanted to go during the cherry blossoms, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm very, yeah, I'm very pleased with, with the results. So, so those are the, you know, the um, happy things, the happy things that happen. And if you pay attention, then this is, you, I, if you pay attention, the film will always tell you, this is what I want to be. And then you just, you just follow that. 我想这就是去剧情片跟非剧集片之间的差异京都的禅风花园作品不会这么的精彩这么的有力量 And I will add that um, you know, as a filmmaker I sort of personally live for that stuff I feel that um, it's, it's those moments that uh, make what I do really worthwhile um, because you, you, in a way, you never really know what your film is. I mean, you, you know what your film is going to be about, but you don't really know what your film is profoundly going to be about until it hits you in the face. And it's those moments, and, and this never fails to me actually, it's always like this. Um, memory, uh, when D Diane O'Bannon. Uh, delivered that final line about, um, you know, Dan being out of time. Um, I, I knew right then, that's the final line. This is, this is it, this is how the film ends. Uh, in 7852, the body double, Marley Renfro, her final line, uh, with the moment she said it, I knew, you know, it's an, it's an ins intuitive thing. It's, it goes back to what William Vickin was talking about. It's an ins instinct thing, you, and you have to trust it because you, it's a, it's about listening and paying attention to what uh, yeah to what the film wants to be. 我觉得这个电影就会告诉你他应该想要找成什么样子所以比如说我们刚才看到在一行内部电影里面的这位导演的遗孀他后来说出这句话了之后我就觉得这句话最适合作为在一行内部纪录片相关纪录片里面的结
walking down under the cherry blossoms with the cherry blossoms just blowing in the wind and and you know and mirror that grace note in the exorcist of course i thought there's no chance in hell we're going to get that shot这个是一个非常有趣的 so you know, I, I think it was day three at this point, and you know, as as we were shooting, you know, we kept just hoping that maybe something like this would happen, and of course it didn't happen. And then we get in a cab, and uh, you know, we were going to a location, and the, the the cab driver just stops us at the bottom of those steps, and we get out of the cab, and there's three geishas just talking at the top of the stairs. This extraordinary, beautiful, probably the most beautiful cherry blossoms that trees that, that you know that we've seen, and so I told my assistant just go talk to them and see if they would just walk. So so they agreed. We started rolling the cameras and and literally the moment they just seconds before they start entering frame, huge gust of wind. The the all the petals start flowing flowing around and I'm like oh my gosh here we go we got we got the shot. So um, you know. That maybe that talk about the mysteries. Maybe that was uh, a gift from God, as uh, as William Friedkin would say. 所以当时我们其实陆陆续续拍了好几天之后都有在寻寻觅觅是不是有机会可以拍到这幅画面我们开拍然后他正要走下来的时候突然一阵强风吹过然后就看到满天的樱花的樱花叶就在眼前樱花瓣就在眼前这样飘散对我来讲这就是最完美的时刻也许这个就是命运或巧合但也可能是我的福克
believes much in, in that. But, um, and I don't know that there was anything really sort of surprising, but if you think about the, the path that that movie took, um, you know, for, for, for him to become the director of it, um, uh, it was a very unlikely story. And I think to me that's probably the, the, the most surprising thing is that that movie was made, that it was made by William Friedkin, um, and that it got an R rating as opposed to an X rating. Um, it was supposed to get an X rating, but it, you know, it, it just turned out that um, that the censor uh, who, who watched the movie actually thought it was a great film that needed to be seen, and actually called Billy and said, you know, we're we're going to give you an R rating because it's it's a movie that needs to be seen. So. Um, it is a miraculous movie uh, in so many ways. It's miraculous that he convinced the studio to go to shoot in Iraq. Um, everything about it is, is, it was miraculous that, that you know, Jason Miller uh, got to be in it. Um, you can go down the list and I think, uh, but I think again, I think the great movies, um, everything great in life is a, a little bit of a miracle, really. 当然，各位可能听说过很多关于这个片场或者这个拍片过程里面有各种神秘的事情或灵异故事等等，比如说拍摄现场很多灵异事件。但我相信，对 Will Ferrell 而言，他可能并没有这么。感兴趣去拍摄，要去讨论这样的话题或这样的主题。当然，在这部片，如果各位了解他的拍摄过程的话，其实有很多神奇之处。比如说，这部片经历了这么过程之后，竟然能够拍出来，然后竟然是 w i l l i a m f r e k e n s 把它拍出来，然后竟然呢，在呃这个比如说电影分级的时候，它本来应该被列为超限级，但是竟然最后能够以限制级过关。然后电影审查人员显然认为这部片值得让大家观看，或者值得让大家讨论之后，打打电话给 w i l l i a m f r e k e n s 说，我们因为这样的原因之后，也许希望能够把它列。为限制级，而不会是超限级，这些都是一些很神奇的过程。那对于他们，他能够去说服电影公司让他去伊拉克拍摄，这就是另外一个神奇的过程。所以我相信，每一个杰出的作品，每一个美好的东西，背后都有很多神奇的时刻。I mean, you know, *Leap of Faith* as well. The film you've just seen is is also a bit of a miracle because、um, it was not supposed to happen.、Um, you know, I was in Spain. When William Friedkin was in Spain, I was I went to one restaurant out of many, many, many that I could have been, and he was at the same restaurant and invited me to his table. <laughs> uh, you know, like it it was not supposed to happen. And then when we were when we ran out of money, and we were trying to get this film in shape for for Venice,、um, we couldn't afford to pay our editor, and I was at a festival in Toronto, and got picked up at the airport and. The guy who got picked up at the same time as me was this guy called David Lawrence, who became my editor. We talked the whole cab ride about this, and、uh, when we ran out of money, I told my producer, I said, "You know, I met this guy on a on a cab in a cab in Toronto, and I think he would be a great editor for this." And I gave him a call, and、uh, and I said, "What are you doing the next two months?" And and I said, "We don't have money. Can you do it?" And he said, "Yes." So, you know, miracles for sure. <笑>其实，就算是各位今天看到这部纪录片过程里面有很多神奇的地方，比如说我刚才提到，我刚好在西班牙，我的 Brooks 也刚好在西班牙，然后我进去在西班牙这么多餐厅里面选了一家餐厅吃饭，刚好我的 Brooks 也在这家餐厅吃饭，然后就邀请我一起共进午餐。然后，实际上在过程里面，这部片并不是有意之间所刻意所完成的电影，而是有很多很多的巧合，很多很多的奇迹或神奇之处所一起构成的电影。比如说，我们作品作品到后面经费用完之后找不到，来不及。不是找不到人做剪辑的时候，我当时正在多伦多准备在机场准备搭计程车到会场或者到旅馆的时候，当时跟我一起共乘计程车的这个人刚好就是一位剪辑师。然后呢，我就跟他讨论之后说，我们这部片的经费用完了，那你接下来两个月的时间有没有时间？哦，要不要有有有没有兴趣跟我们一起合作？然后我就打电话给我制作人说，我刚好在多伦多遇到这个人，他应该可以做做作为很好的剪辑师。然后打电话给他，然后让请他帮忙，让我们一起完成这部作品。所以这部片的完成跟这部片能够在各位面前面出现，其实也有很多神奇的事情。I I think that、uh, you know to me it's not it's not about the scares it's not about the jump scares or the easy tricks but it's about it's about how certain films can get under your skin and they get under your skin because you have a sense. That the material gets under the skin of the filmmaker, 
and therefore, if that's what happens, then you're that you feel that much closer to the filmmaker than you you do in many other films, um, because they're showing you a side of them that is you know any any time anybody says this is what I'm afraid of, they're making themselves vulnerable to you, and I think that. Uh, the great horror filmmakers, in a way, make themselves very vulnerable to their audience because they're showing what they are afraid of. And I, I can't think of, of anything more, more powerful than that. I like horror films because they are恐怖片可以让你看完之后有毛骨悚然的站立的感觉生命中的弱点他们害怕的事情Oh boy. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, again, I, I, uh, first of all, I really want to say that it's... Um, uh, I will say two things, actually. I, I will say one, that it's... Uh, to have been able to spend this amount of time with someone like William Friedkin, um, who has obviously you know, been one of my heroes forever, um, and... Uh, but, but, but more than a hero, more than a great filmmaker, I think he's just an extraordinary human being. Uh, this has been the great privilege of, of my you know, career as a filmmaker to date. Uh, and, and also to, to be able to share my work um, around the world uh, you know, with, with people and cultures that I would never have dreamt many years ago to to get to encounter to be here in in Taiwan and 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 just uh, it's an extraordinary experience and I feel so blessed and I, I sometimes pinch myself and I don't know how I got to be so lucky to do what I love and to share what I love with with people like you and so I just want to say thank you it's it's wonderful to be here thank you very much. Thank you.